welcome to Laura's Job Talk. Yay! Okay. Um, so, I mean, most of you know Laura. She did her PhD at Loyola University of Chicago, finished in 2015, and has since been managing Project Media. So she's been affiliated with us for ever, basically, right? Feels that Forever, way. yeah. <laughs> so that's your introduction. Awesome. Um, who to ask? Natalie's going to pray for us, and then cool. you can just launch right into it. Great. Changed my mind. I think I'm going back over here. I have more room to move over here. So uh, I'm really excited to be here today. Thank you for having me here to talk about my research. I'm going to focus today on the neuro part of my work, which I would say is probably 50 to a quarter percent of my research. Um, I'm hoping it would be more 50 if resources were different, but it's definitely at least a quarter of my work. And this is really where I see myself in terms of research adding value to multiple faculty in the department or I'm just a neuro snob and I think I'm adding value to this department, and that's okay. So I wanna start first by doing a really brief overview of ERP and EEG methodology. I understand that we have a really wide variety of backgrounds in here, and so I think it's important that we just go over the basics of what is an ERP, what are we and what are we not measuring with ERPs, where we think your research could fit in, hopefully you'll get when we start talking about the methodology. Um, if you've heard me speak to a non-neuro audience before, you have heard this, so I'm sorry in advance, but we'll just refresh. And then we're gonna do a really brief review of the literature on the effects of media violence on behavior non-neurologically, and then we're gonna go into some of my current work looking at the short-term effects of media violence on neurological processing, okay? Uh, and then future directions, because I have to talk about that too, so then we'll talk about future directions. So anytime your brain does anything, it releases electrical energy. And we can measure those changes in electrical energy through the scalp using EEG. So when I have someone participate in one of my EEG studies, they come into the lab, we place a swim cap, basically, on their head, and then we place a small amount of salty gel in holes in the cap. That is helping with connectivity between the scalp and the sensor, and then I plug sensors. Those sensors are recording and amplifying those changes in electrical energy. In terms of neuro, this is really cost-effective and non-invasive. So if you think of like an MRI at BYU, where the MRI facility is heavily subsidized, it is 200 bucks for every hour of scan time. That is heavily subsidized. At Northwestern, it's like 400 to 500, pretending, depending on what grants are currently running there. So this, in terms of consumable costs, costs me like 10 to 15 bucks. It's really cheap for neuro. And totally non-invasive. We do this on babies, we do this on pregnant women, um, and you can have a permanent retainer, which you can't with fMRI, which we're learning with BYU. Um, so it's just, it's a really flexible, accessible, cheap neuroscience method, okay? When I collect that raw EEG, I get something that looks like this. I can gain really interesting information in terms of alpha and beta waves and gamma waves and asymmetry from this data. I'm just learning that world. Truthfully and at my core, I'm an ERPer, which means an event-related potential or an ERP researcher. ERPs by Steve Luck, who is arguably the leading expert in this methodology and getting good data from ERP, defines an ERP as a consistent pattern of EEG that are triggered by a stimulus and are embedded in that overall EEG. So let me give you an example in plain English of what that means. If I bring you into my lab and I show you on the screen X's and O's over and over and over again, and then I get raw trials that look just like what I just showed you. That's raw EEG on each of those trials. As I lock time to the presentation of that stimulus, and then I average together all of those X trials, now I go from this to something that looks like this. These peaks and valleys and these waveforms, we believe, are reflective of underlying cognitive processes. Okay? So this is your basic what ERPs are. Let's go over some more ERP nomenclature and terminology. Anything, anytime we put an ERP on the screen, time zero should be the presentation of the stimuli because all ERPs are stimuli dependent. This is super important if this is out of your research area. So if I call something a P300, I can have multiple P300s that reflect totally different underlying cognitive processes based on the stimuli being used, based on where in the brain we're measuring things, and based on what you're doing in the task. So it's super important when you think of ERPs, there's nothing inherently special about an ERP. It's the cognitive process in tandem with that ERP that's important, okay? All right, because we're talking about waveforms, we're talking about differences in amplitude or the area under these curves and latency when in time that crest happens. Everything I present to you today is using 
uh, mean amplitude and fractional area latencies. These are more conservative estimates of amplitude and latency. They are Steve Luck's recommendation. And I'm going to show you some slides that just naturally happened in my data, why we use that measure. Mean amplitude and fractional area latencies are less receptive to noise in your data. And so it's, it's really responsible. If you leave this lecture with nothing else, be converted to Steve Luck, mean amplitude, 50% fractional area latency is the right <coughs> methodology. Okay, that is the right way to do it. That's what you want us to think. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe some more than that. Uh, all the ERPs I plot today are going to be positive up, negative down. There was this rumor when I started doing this research that that was flipped. I've never actually seen research that flips it. So we have officially done away with that in this field. Positive should be going up, negative should be going down. Um, anything labeled with a P is a positive going waveform. Anything labeled with an N is a negative going waveform. And then you're going to see a number afterwards generally. That's reflective of roughly when in time we think that that crest happens. Okay? So a P300, positive going waveform, roughly 300 milliseconds after exposure to some stimuli. If you'll see on this screen, we're dealing with differences in microvolts, the change in electrical energy, and time on this axis. ERPs are amazingly time sensitive. I can tell down to the millisecond when electrical energy is being released, when your brain is doing something, okay? Something like fMRI, amazing at telling me where in the brain something is happening. Gets at those deep processes, can get at the amygdala, but the bold response, which is what you're measuring with MRI, is slow, it's so slow. So if I wanna know time course questions, ERPs are the methodology to answer that. If I wanna know about deep brain structures, ERPs are pretty crappy at that because you have your scalp that is impeding that change in electrical energy. So ERPs are not the appropriate methodology to tell me exactly where in the brain something is happening. They are the appropriate uh, methodology to look at really early cognitive processes and quick things, okay? All right, so that is my rough and dirty, quick overview of ERPs. I'm hoping we're feeling pretty good because now we're gonna add a social component and mix it up. <laughs> so primarily what got me into this research was being interested in the effects of media violence on behavior. There have been decades of research on this topic and I'm just gonna summarize really quickly for you the behavioral effects that we have seen for decades. Short-term exposure to media violence is related to increased aggression, decreased pro-social behavior and empathic responding, increased aggressive thoughts and priming, less sympathy for real life victims of violence, and physiological desensitization to real violence, typically measured through heart rate and skin conductance. And people who've just been expo exposed to media violence rate real life violence as less severe and less important to worry about. And we know that there are a lot of factors that influence these relationships. Your biological state, your culture, the social environment in which you're engaging with the media can all strengthen or weaken these effects, as well as formal features of the media itself, how the violence is depicted, all can strengthen or weaken these effects. Okay? So one of the most important places, oh, sorry. So in 2001, Bushman and Anderson presented a theoretical model about why we might be seeing these effects to help explain theoretically why this is happening. And really, most of the work in this area is built, built on social neuroscience, and they've really focused on this part right here, your internal affective state, your cognition, and your arousal. The results I just showed you really summarize how those three routes are influenced by short-term exposure to media violence. But I read a series of studies that were done in the mid-2000s where some researchers had people play a violent video game and then showed them angry or happy faces and just saw how quickly they could identify these morphed faces. They were a mix of angry and happy and then they morphed out of those, right? And behaviorally, they were seeing this effect. And that got me thinking, huh, is it earlier? Is there a possibility that short-term exposure and media violence changes the way we process the world around us? And if that's possible, can I tap it neurologically? And so that's really how I brought this neuro and this media violence piece together because neuro can answer these really early questions that maybe I don't see the effects behaviorally, but maybe I'm seeing them at the neurological level, okay? One of the most important ways we gain information about the world around us is through the human face. This is really for my emotional support that I put this up here, but <laughs> when I put this image up on the screen, your brain quickly and automatically and with very little conscious awareness is processing the emotional information contained in these faces. You are attending to the fact that that is happiness, sadness, and some kind of emotion on the end that we're on here, okay? You are processing this. 
We believe that the ability to identify and interpret and prioritize emotional information contained in faces is essential for social functioning and survival, and as a result, it is heavily evolutionarily based, okay? In terms of the neural correlates associated with this, there's been tons of research on this, which is awesome for me because I want to manipulate it with a social factor. I have a clear understanding of what the neuro components associated with facial processing are. And that's really the key. As you're sitting here thinking, what do I, can I do something with this? The key is figuring out what do we know a lot about in terms of neuro already, and then let's manipulate it with our individual research areas. That's, that's the crux. Don't try to invent a new tasks, okay? It's, it's just too complicated. All right, so in terms of the neural correlates, the first thing we see is the P100. This is generated from the primary visual cortex in the posterior portion of the brain. As a result of it being back here, it's very automatic. Without conscious awareness, happens really, really quickly. It's a positive going waveform because it's labeled with a P. And there's a really mixed literature regarding the effect of face valence on the P100. Some studies show that threat-related stimuli result in increased amplitudes and delayed latency for threat-related faces. This would be reflective of your brain working harder and attending more to threat-related stimuli. Other studies don't find this effect. In general, that is likely due to sample size. This is probably a pretty small to medium effect. You need large sample sizes to see it. That's not very common in neuro work. So that's part of why we see a mixed effect there. The next component that we know a lot about is the N170. Here we are very clearly getting into the idea that this is a human face and I am processing that this is human. So we really know that the N170 is sensitive and it deals with the processing of human faces. This is definitely generated from the fusiform gyrus. As, as a result, it's lateralized. It's generally right over your mastoid bones. So we measure it right around there. And there is a, it's a negative going waveform because it's labeled with an N. And there's a very large body of research supporting that threat-related stimuli result in increased amplitudes and delayed latencies. For a negative going waveform, this would look like more negative, ampli more negative amplitudes, delayed latencies for this N170 for threat-related faces and stimuli, okay? So facial processing is super important, but this is really early. We're talking about 170 milliseconds after exposure to a stimuli. This is not getting into top-down cognitive control. This is really bottom-up processing, right? And so I'm really interested in, okay, so maybe short-term exposure and media violence modulates this. That's just half of the equation. No one is running around just engaging based on how they're viewing the world. Maybe that's part of it, but I got I to gotta tap into this more. It's, it's this interplay between cognition and emotion that's important. And that's when I became interested in this idea of response inhibition. Uh, response inhibition is your ability to inhibit a dominant response in favor of a less dominant response. So can I stop doing something when I want to do something else? Okay, I can't always, but this is the goal. This is like <laughs> the result of a healthy adult. Um, in terms of my work with my task, we see a broad ERP component associated with this, which we've labeled as an N2 P300. If you want lots of details about why ours is broad, it's the way our task is designed. Um, this is definitely generated from the anterior cingulate cortex or the ACC. This is very top-down cognitive process. Now you are working, it is effort to have this type of control. Uh, okay, and there is also still here a very mixed literature regarding the effects of media violence on control processes. I have some theories. I'm hoping you believe me when I say why there's this mixed literature. In general, in the world of cognitive neuroscience, the way we talk about cognitive control is different than social psychologists and developmental psychologists talk about it. We talk about executive functions, meaning a broad umbrella term that includes a bunch of different tiny things. Response inhibition, shifting, working memory, um, all kinds of different things. Inhibitory control, and we measure each of those individually at the neurological level. We see them as working together, but very distinct components. In general, with the research on the effects of media violence on cognitive control, we focus on impulsivity, which is a very broad construct to a neuroscientist. And as a result, we get really mixed literature. Some studies are finding that short-term exposure to media violence modulates this. In general, developmental studies suggest that chronic exposure to violent media leads to more impulsivity and attention problems. But when I break this down, my results are way less consistent. If you do research looking at spatial orientation, which is a very important part of cognitive control, playing violent video games makes you better at spatially orienting. And it makes perfect sense why that would be the case. You're constantly visually rotating things, you're constantly engaging with an environment, you're training yourself to be good at spatial attending and visual attending, so you see that result neurologically, okay?
So this is part of the mixed literature. It's because we're talking about it differently, even though we're trying to get at the same thing, we're talking about it totally differently, okay? Okay, so in terms of my previous work, I've been trying to answer some of these questions. How do these things interact? I wanna just briefly touch base on some of my previous work. We looked at the short-term exposure of media violence to the neural correlates of the processing of afraid and angry faces, and we looked at implicit processing. And I saw modulation in these early P100 and 170 components. So that led me to say, okay, there might be something real going on here. Let's keep going. So then we did another study where we looked at if you're chronically exposed to my violent media, what happens? Again, we saw modulation in these early ERP components, and now we saw differences in cognitive control measured through the, um, the, that broad N2P300, okay? So now we're seeing both when I look at short-term versus chronic. But both of these studies use an implicit measure of emotion processing, and both of these studies use afraid faces and happy faces. I use the afraid faces because I was really interested in the interaction with empathy. How does empathy play with this? And when I talked to a bunch of social cognitive neuroscientists that studied empathy, they said, you need to use afraid faces. That taps something totally different than these other phrases. But now that I've done that, or started to do that, now I'm like, okay, but my crux of my research was based on behavioral work looking at anger and violence. And so now I wanna use angry faces. And now I wanna know, does it matter if you're implicitly or explicitly processing emotion? Do we see different effects? And so really what we did with this is, I'm gonna sneak this on you two studies <laughs> to answer that question, and we're gonna get through it. We just finished collecting this data um, in September. So the results I'm gonna to present to you are early, not peer-reviewed preliminary data. I haven't looked at moderators or mediators yet. We've collected a ton of those, but I'm already seeing some really cool differences in implicit processing and explicit processing after short-term exposure to media violence when I look at half angry and happy faces, okay? So for these studies, both of them are with, within subject design. You're gonna see this visually and I'm gonna try to point it out, but Steve Luck really argues the ERPs are widely variable across participants and highly not variable <laughs> within participants. So if I bring someone back day to day, their ERPs look freaking the same. But if I'm looking at two different people, my husband's and my ERPs, because we pilot on each other all the time, look totally <laughs> different. That poor sucker has During been capped. Absolutely. <laughs> my poor husband has been capped more than anyone else to, to get this right. So I always use it within subject design for these type of studies where I'm generally dealing with a very small effect size or a small to medium effect to keep my power under control, okay? But in both studies, participants were brought into the lab and shown either a violent or a nonviolent film clip and then completed a stop signal task um, while their EEG was recorded on a 64 channel biosemi active system. You don't need to know that if you don't do ERP work, but it's essential to good ERP work that I say it, so I'm saying it, okay. <laughs> Um, one week later, we brought participants back into the lab and switched the film condition, and they completed the exact same task. Okay, so this is a true within subject design. Um, presentation of the film clips were counterbalanced to eliminate order effects. And I'm next going to talk about there was an implicit version of the stop signal task and an explicit version of the stop signal task, and I will go in great detail about that next. Okay, uh, and yep, we just talked about that. All the participants for this study were undergraduate college students. In the first study, we had an N of 40, which for neuro, not to toot my own horn, but that is very large for neuro. Uh, it's still probably too small, but this is the world that we're dealing with. And then for study two, it was 47, okay? So for this stop signal task, and this is a point in this talk, if you don't understand the, the task, you should stop me, okay? Usually we like to let people finish, but if you don't understand what I'm saying, stop me, have me clarify until we understand the task, because it's important to the ERPs. Again, I'm interested in this interaction between emotion and cognition. So it should feel like there's two tasks built in one within my task, because there are. <laughs> so let's first talk about the explicit version of this task. In the explicit version of this task, participants are brought into the lab, and on 50% of the trials, so half the trials, they're shown a face on the screen. That face is either angry or happy. And they just tell me as quickly and accurately as possible, is this face angry or happy? It's an explicit emotion processing task, right? Randomly intermixed within those trials are another 50% of the trials, which are our stop trials. On these trials, after the presentation of the face, a black and white box flashes on the screen behind the face, and this signals to participants on these trials, you do not respond, okay? So you're going through and telling me, angry, happy, angry, happy, angry, happy, flashing box, I don't respond on these trials. Really clear response inhibition, okay? 
What's particularly sexy about our task, in my opinion, is the presentation of the face and the stop signal. Yes, I just said sexy about your research. Uh, the delay between the presentation of the face and that stop signal is jittered based on your performance. So the better you are at inhibiting behavior, the longer the delay, the harder the task becomes. The worse you are at inhibiting behavior, the faster that stop signal shows up and the easier the task becomes. So we really are modulating to your individual level, that's an awesome ring, uh, <laughs> your individual level of inhibitory control, of response inhibition, okay? So that's the explicit version of the task. In the implicit version of the task, now when those faces appear on the screen, instead of telling me the emotion in that face, you are telling me the gender of that face. Is it a male or a female face? Emotion is completely irrelevant to task performance, but you're doing the exact same task. Okay? How do we feel? You feel good? Great. Okay. Now let's go to the results. Um, the results of our explicit study first. Behaviorally, we see no effect of media violence exposure on people's ability to identify emotion and inhibit behavior in the presence of emotion. We do see significant valence effects where everyone is slower at identifying the emotion of those angry faces. Anger is attention grabbing and distracting. Even when it's relevant to task performance, you're a little slower because you're so busy going, that's an angry face, that it takes you a little bit longer to respond. As a result, you have a split second longer to see that flashing box on the screen for the stop signal, so you perform a little bit better on the stop trials. So by being slower on the go trials, you are performing better on the stop trials. Does that make sense? Okay. And again, this is all related to the fact that threat-related stimuli is attention grabbing. Okay. In terms of the ERPs, we see no effects of media violence, again, on this explicit version of the task. We do see a lot of valence effects. We see that expected larger amplitude and delayed latency in the P100. Um, I'm going to walk you through this. So since we don't see any media violence effects, just focus on the red versus the white lines because that is our valence effect. The red lines, and we're talking about this component right here, are angry faces, and the white lines are happy faces. You can see slightly larger and delayed latencies for the angry faces as compared to happy faces. Your brain is working harder. It is attending more to threat-related stimuli than non-threat-related faces, okay? Uh, let me just walk you through this a little bit too. Time zero right here is the presentation of the face. This is milliseconds. We're talking about this component right here. What you're seeing is all of the correct trials for all go trials for all participants in this study, okay? So that's why it looks smooth and beautiful because there's a lot of people, a lot of trials. That's how you get these nice clean ERPs, okay? We also see an effect in the N170, which is what we'd expect. This right here is our N170. Increased amplitudes, more negative amplitudes for the red lines versus the white lines, okay? And we don't see any differences in your ability to inhibit behavior in the presence of angry or happy faces after exposure to media violence or whether the face is angry or happy, okay? So again, we see these valence effects that we'd expect, but media violence isn't interplaying here. When we get to the implicit version of this task, things become more interesting. Behaviorally, we see, again, that everyone is less accurate at those go trials for angry faces. Now, even when emotion is irrelevant to task performance, now faces are really distracting that are angry, or that are angry, right? You're thinking, oh, this isn't relevant, but I'm so distracted by the fact that this face is angry and it's threat-related. Here, we see a really nice um, condition by valence interaction. So this is your percent accuracy on those go trials. The red line is angry faces, the white line is happy faces. This is your nonviolent condition, this is your violent condition. Same participants. After being exposed to a nonviolent film clip, we see the difference that we'd expect, where people are less accurate at identifying the gender of angry faces because that emotion is irrelevant to task performance and it's distracting. Okay? After exposure to a violent film clip, no significant difference here. There's no differentiation between those angry and happy faces in your accuracy on those go trials. Okay? In terms of the ERPs associated with this, we see no effect in the P100. We do see those expected N170 more negative for threat-related stimuli, but now we still see that significant condition by, condition by valence interaction. Here's the ERP. We're talking about this component right here. I want you to think about the ERP I showed you earlier for the N170. It was much higher. It was much fatter, right? This is that variability across participants that we're talking about. Still same component, still same underlying cognitive process, wildly different, wildly different end result based on who your participants are, okay? All right. 
if you're less comfortable looking here, um, your dotted lines are the violent condition, your solid lines are the nonviolent condition. I'm not super comfortable seeing interaction effects on an ERP. It's very challenging. So I like the plots. It's way more helpful for me. So now this is that amplitude still. After the exposure to that nonviolent film, we're seeing those more negative amplitudes for threat-related faces, which we'd expect. Those angry faces are attention-grabbing. After exposure to a violent film, we don't see any difference in the N170 between happy and angry faces. Okay? In terms of the stop trials, everyone is more accurate at identifying the, or at inhibiting behavior in the presence of angry faces. Again, that split second that you're over-attending makes it easier to inhibit behavior. And we don't see any differences in the N170, I want, or into, in the ERP components. I want to show you this to like really drive home my point about using mean amplitude and fractional area latency. So most of the ERPs I've shown you today are super smooth. These nice, beautiful smooth. That happens through more trials and more participants. But even with a lot of trials and a lot of participants, sometimes, and this is totally normal noise within your data, you get these peaks and jags in your components. Generally, when we write papers, we apply a smoothing filter before we visually present the data. So when we run our analyses, we never apply a smoothing filter. But when we show you our data, we always do, so they always look nice and smooth. But in reality, this is actually what they look like. If you do not use the more conservative measure, you could be pulling from right here and having fake effects that are just noise in your data. Okay? So hopefully you've been converted. There's nothing inherently different about that little bump. It's still the same broad component and underlying cognitive process. Use the more conservative approach. Okay? All right. So what does this mean? This is, uh, yeah. What does this mean? Um, here's what I think it means. When participants are forced to attend to emotion, there's no effect of media violence. They can overcome those short-term effects of media violence in behaviorally and neurologically. But angry faces are more attention-grabbing, which is exactly what we'd expect from the literature. It's a threat-related stimuli. You give it more increased cognitive resources and attention, and we see that behaviorally. When you don't have to attend to emotion, when emotion is irrelevant to task performance, we see that after exposure to a nonviolent film clip, there's these really important differences in valence effects where people attend more to threat-related stimuli, and we'd expect that. But after short-term exposure to media violence, we don't see that differentiation anymore, behaviorally or neurologically. And so, for me, this is continued evidence of this idea of desensitization, that maybe exposure to media violence is desensitizing or changing us to the way we process the world around us, even at the most basic level, in particular when emotion is irrelevant and when emotion is involved. Okay? So what do I want to do next? This, uh, just if you're looking at your clock thinking, that was quick and short, this is going to be a non-traditional job talk. Just buckle up. We're on this ride together. <laughs> We're doing this. Um, so what's next? I'm really interested in continuing this line of work at looking at the short-term effects of media violence exposure on the neural correlates of emotion processing and inhibitory control processes and how they work together. I, have, I could spend the rest of my career just looking at this and I could maybe in 20 years be like, okay, I think this is what's actually happening. There's just nothing else out there on this and so I have a lot of work to do and I'm excited to do that. I'm also really interested as a result of this research in this interaction between ag um, affective processing and cognition. We used to believe that the parts of the brain that processed emotion and the parts of the brain that did higher order thinking were totally separate. And that is just not true. We know that that's not true anymore. FMRI and connectivity studies make it so clear that these are highly related processes that are communicating constantly and that sometimes emotion helps performance and sometimes it inhibits the whole performance. But we need a lot more ERP work here. This would be a, just a great basic science place to do some research, and I'm pretty excited about that. I'm also really interested in, broadly speaking, the effects of media on development. Thank you, Project Media, for this one. But we just don't have good longitudinal research on what it means to grow up in a digitally immersive environment. We just don't have good research on that. And so I'm stoked to be a part of, part of Project Media, and I'm proud to be a part of Project Media, where we're trying to answer these big questions about what are the long-term effects and how can parents interplay with this of being in this digitally immersive environment on your core developmental outcomes, on your language development, on your cognition, hopefully on your neural correlates, right? There's just lots we could do here. But really, all of my research is born out of this broad interest in how social factors influence affective processing. So all of the research that I built my research on was based on work on trauma and PTSD 
and um, kids of abuse and neglect and how they show abnormalities and how they process faces. And that's really what got me interested in this. I've also had five years to think about how I would fit in this department and how we can make that work. And I think this is the key. Broadly speaking, I'm super interested in how any social factor influence these early cognitive processes. And I'm happy to be a part of bringing that methodology to people that maybe aren't super comfortable with that. I was not a neuroscientist. I'm a, I'm a product of this master's program, right? And I was not in Chris Porter's lab. So I, I was not a neuro person. And I ended up in a PhD program where I did not feel like we were producing enough. And I had a PhD advisor who was wonderful and awesome, but basically not doing research anymore. And I started going, what am I gonna do? And I took a neuroscience class and fell in love with this. And I had a professor who said, you wanna do this? Let's write a grant, we'll do it. We didn't get the grant, but we wrote the grant and we still did it anyway. And that's how all of this was born. And so I am passionate about helping non-neuro people become confident and comfortable in the neuro world, even if it's just one or two studies. I am, someone did it for me and it changed my whole trajectory and I'm super willing to do it for others. Um, we called ourselves the Island of Misfit Toys in that grad lab <laughs> and it was accurate and awesome and I'm super grateful and I wanna help that for other people. Okay, so I want you guys to ask questions. I want you to have time to ask questions, but I also am extremely cognizant of the fact that I am asking for something so weird and that I only have an hour with all of you suckers in a room together uh, <laughs> to talk about that. Um, so I want, I'm gonna steal some of my time to talk about this. Um, and I'm mostly gonna talk about how we got here and give you time to ask the really hard and uncomfortable questions because you all deserve that and I want to actually do that. And I'd rather speak for myself than have someone else speak for me. I am really tired and my ability to regulate my emotions when I'm tired is so much worse, so bear <laughs> with me in this. Um, uh, dang it, Laura. Um, it was like really important to me that I not come across as a hysterical woman in this talk. And it's already started. That's so we're, gender stereotype. That's why we're, it was important to me. We're not <laughs> here. No. Um, hysterical. So I want to start this conversation, and this is why this is uncomfortable for me, for, by saying there are a lot of people in this room who have invested heavily in my career and who I love and adore dearly, and nothing changes regardless of how this plays out. Dang it. Um, my love and confidence in this department is fixed and secure, and this is not personal. So regardless of the outcome of all of this, you are loved, whether you know me or not. If you don't know me, people who do know me hired you, and I love them. Therefore, I love you, and I trust you. <laughs> totally true. You all have my total confidence. Um, and so just because you've been loyal to me in the past does not mean you need to continue to support something that you're not comfortable with. I sincerely, sincerely mean that. Dang it. Um, and I, I just hope that at the end of this, that is so clear that there are, there's no ego involved in this. It never has to be awkward. I'm not going anywhere regardless of how this turns out. You are stuck with me. Um, so regardless of how this turns out, please don't feel uncomfortable. Please don't feel awkward. It's totally okay, okay? I sincerely mean that. All right, we got a long way to go still. So, um, so how did we get here? Just to be totally explicit, I am asking for and have from the beginning asked for a part-time part -time tenure track position where I'm not physically living in Utah. That is just the reality of what I'm asking for. So let's talk about it. Um, let's talk about how we got here. Let's talk about how we got here. So five years ago, I applied for this department for a really traditional, normal job. Totally normal job. It was an amazing experience and wonderful and awesome. It was awesome. And I was offered a job by Dean Ogles and two days later my husband matched for a residency in Portland, Maine. <laughs> and um, as we talked through how we could possibly make this work, how I could live most of the time in Provo and fly back and forth and we were totally thinking through every creative solution to make this work. In my heart of hearts, I knew it was the wrong decision for my family. Oh, I'm so sorry, gosh dang it. Um, I knew it was the wrong decision for my family. And so I said, okay, we can't do this. And I remember when I, it's burned in my mind when I told my husband we can't do this and I'm not gonna do it, it's not the right call. We were holding hands and he promised me that he would do everything in his power to get us back to Utah, he promised me. And it, he has been so true to that promise, so true. 
Uh, my husband's a urology resident, someday hopefully going to have a real job and be a surgeon. Uh, <laughs> and he has been flirting with this group here in Provo for three years. And I call it flirting because it is totally flirting. It is like we are back on the dating market again. He has been flirting with this group in Provo for three years. And consistently throughout this three years, we have had red flag after red flag after red flag of what it was going to do to our family if he took this job. There is no flexibility. There is no work-family balance. What is that going to look like when I'm also trying to work? Over and over and over again, we had these red flags. And over and over and over again, we both shoved that square peg in that round hole and said, we are doing this. We are doing this. You plow your way into that practice, Chris. We're doing this. Uh, and he did. He did. He did exactly what he promised me we would do. But this summer, as we were trying to figure out what to do with applying and trying to make all the pieces work, they were taking too long with the contract. And we were freaking out. We have lots of med school loans. We have got to have a job next year. Uh, and so we started looking at other options and other positions, really as an emergency backup plan in case things fell through. And in the process of doing this, we found a job that is so much healthier for my husband. And in every way, shape, or form, my husband gave this to me and said, I will go where you want me to go. I will do it. We will make this dream happen. We will shove that square peg in the round hole. And he said it much more supportive than I'm saying it, right? He was like, you got this floor. We'll make it work. We'll make it work. We'll make it work. And we fasted and prayed over it. And I overwhelmingly knew that it was not the right call for my family. To make this move to job is not the right call for my family. And when I made that decision, I 100% knew that that meant I was not applying to this department as well. Let me be so clear about that. When we decided to not move here, I said, my relationship with the school family life is going to continue as it currently is, and when Project Media runs out of money, or when they're done with me, which is totally possible, um, we will reevaluate and I will be okay, because I have always been okay. Heavenly Father has blessed me exponentially through all these processes, it's going to be okay. That was the plan. And so if there are enough people in this department invested that as I fasted and prayed and we're like, okay, we're doing Montana, and it was time to send the email where I said, okay, we're not, we're not applying to BYU, here's why. Overwhelmingly, I knew that was wrong, <laughs> that I felt horrible about the decision of not applying. I spent a solid two to three weeks pleading with Henley Potter saying, you are giving me conflicting information. What am I supposed to do with this? This is so unfair, because we're pretty blind. Um, so there were a lot of, <laughs> there were a lot of, what the freak are you doing to me here? How am I supposed to do this? And so in the midst of my, what the freak are we doing here? I got an email from Alan that said, applications are due on Friday or next week. What's happening? And I panicked. I said, what am I supposed to I can't tell Alan that I'm having these conflicting feelings. So I called my husband. I said, what am I supposed to do? I feel horrible about not applying, but we're not moving here. What am I supposed to do? And he said, tell him the truth. It's BYU. <laughs> tell him the truth. Um, so I sent Alan the first of many epically long emails <laughs> outlining, what should I do? And Alan did what everyone in this room would want a department chair to do. He called me and he said, Laura, we support you in doing what is best for your family, and please let me convince you to come to Utah, and here's how I'm going to do it. It was two totally different conversations in one. He, he was so true to what you want. He was like, please, let's, let's convince you that Utah is the right fit for your family. And in the midst of that conversation, I had that revelation that I had been desperately seeking for three weeks of a different plan. I know that this looks totally different than what any of us planned for my job, for my career. It looks totally different than what I planned for my career too. I promise you I could not have come up with this on my own because it's crazy. Um, and I don't know how this is gonna play out. I, I sincerely do not know how this is gonna play out. It could fail at this level. It probably will fail at another level. That's not my problem. <laughs> my problem is acting on personal revelation that I have received. And I don't get revelation for the rest of you in this room. I wanna be so clear about that. I do not get revelation for the rest of the people in this room. My job was to come have this conversation. That's my job. You guys get to fat about it, have fun. Uh, <laughs> that's, not, that's not my job. This is me acting on my revelation of what works for my family. But I want you to know that this wasn't my desperate attempt to make BYU work. I love this department. I love you weirdos in this department. That is irrelevant to whether I'm here or not. I hope that you know that that is sincere. I hope that you know that I genuinely, sincerely want what is best for this department. I don't know how this plays out. That's not, that's not my job. 
but I know that I'm supposed to be here having this conversation. And I'm super grateful that we got to this point and that we had this conversation. I also want you to know that I, I love you weirdos enough that I would not be here had I not spent significant amount of time on my knees pleading with the Lord of, if you ask me to do this and we go out on this limb and we take this risk and it by some miracle works out, I can't fail at this. I, I feel that. I hope you know that I feel that. And I would not be here if I had not already had confirmation that while it will be imperfect, I will not fail at this. As I cling to my Father in heaven, he will multiply my efforts and I will do this. It will be imperfect. Hopefully you're seeing through this conversation that I am imperfect. Uh, and no matter how good my teaching presentation was or no matter how much you love ERPs now, you should know that this, this version of me is probably the calmest I've ever been in my entire life. <laughs> so if this is feeling not calm, imagine it times 10. And this is, that's actually normal Laura. So you should go in full disclosure on who I actually am. I'm highly neurotic. I'm highly imperfect. People used to tell me in high school I would switch to decaf. They were like, what is, you are so, yeah. And that's accurate. It's all accurate. I also will make lots of mistakes. And I will say I'm sorry, and I will try harder, and I will be loyal to the people in this department and to this department regardless of what kind of happens, okay? Dang it. So just know, if you leave this with nothing else, know that I wasn't trying to cause problems. Dang it. That you needed this department that I love that's not trying to cause problems. That I was not um, so invested in my own ego that I was like, I'm so important to BYU. There's a lot of people that can do what I do. That is so not what this is about. Um, I am just trying to do what I felt was the revelation for me to do. And I'm sorry if in the process I've already caused problems because that is not the goal. Um, I guess all I'm asking after this is to put in the spiritual effort that I put into this. Maybe not the same because it's been rough. Don't do that. It's been a rough couple months. Just actually think about it actually pray about it. I have full confidence in this whole group's ability to actually act on what they receive, and I am totally confident with whatever we all receive. I can only receive revelation from me. So act on it, think about it, ponder it, and come what may, Lord South Hill's going to be okay. It's going to be okay, um, and the department's going to be okay, and it'll work out the way it's supposed to. I want to make sure that you guys can ask really hard, uncomfortable questions, maybe even illegal questions about with them. Um, no illegal questions. I know Angela said that, but you can, I promise. Um, uh, so I, I want to make sure that you can ask questions. You're not going to offend me, I promise. My ego is so not in this anymore. It's just not. Uh, so you're not going to offend me. You should ask hard questions. You should ask about how we're going to make this work. You should ask about if my family is actually on board. I will answer all the questions the best that I can. And when I don't know, I will tell you I don't know. And we can go from there. <laughs> okay, so first, let's thank her for her presentation. Oh, thank you. <laughs> So they watched the video clip mm -hmm. of the media, of, of Violent Beach video. Mm -hmm. Then they did this task. Uh -huh. And then you got this brand. What was the time frame of all that? How yeah, so it takes last? about 30 minutes to put a cap on someone. So okay. since it takes about 30 minutes, we cap them, but we don't run it. Right. Then they watch the film clip, and then right after they complete our task. The task is about 30 minutes. So what and, was the level of violence? I mean, we're talking rated R blood. Uh -huh. we're talking yeah, so I, it would be tricky at BYU. Um, <laughs> we watched a scene from Kill Bill where they're in a knife fight. It's like real intense knife fight. And then the nonviolent condition has to be equally arousing. That's right. super important for neural work. And so we used a seance scene from a whole, uh, scary movie from What Lies Beneath. We need to update those clips, but and there's no reason for it. Each of those clips are five to ten minutes, right? Yeah. yeah, I think it's closer to ten. So they're watching a violent clip for ten minutes, five to ten minutes, and then they're doing the task mm -hmm. to stop or go task for ten minutes. Okay. For about 30 minutes. In yeah. general, short-term effects, we you're safe within a 30-minute window. After that... The longer you delay, right. the worse the effect. So we try to keep it quick, but I would really like to do a short-term well, longitudinal study on this. I was, as you were explaining your results, and I, I'm impressed with all you've done, but I was wondering, how is watching the media different than any other fearful task that happens? 
Yeah, because so the effect would still be there right after, even if it's fifteen, even if it's ten, five to ten minutes. Right after, yeah. you're still going to react like you're afraid, even if it's not me yet. It could be a bear, yes. it could be a tiger, it could be my mom, it could be. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think what's different here is the comparison is between an equally arousing and equally engaging violent okay. and nonviolent clip, right? right? So here we can pinpoint that yeah, there's something about the violence itself that's so the playing clips into are it. Different. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense. Yep. Thank you. And we um, so th this is like I used your stimuli. Long time yeah. Ago, we like did pilot studies. Yeah. So I'm sure that they were like similar. No, that makes sense. I missed that part of the presentation. Yeah, yeah. So thank you. So that ironically, the reason we use Sarah's film clips are not because she's Sarah and I'm related to her. She's one of the only researchers in this area that use physio data to control their film clips. And you have to have that data with neuro. I can't just assume they're equally engaging and arousing. They actually have to be physiologically equally engaging and arousing. And that's one of the only studies that's ever done that. So we have to update those clips. <laughs> yeah. I'm so coming from a more um, more idea of family, big picture stuff. Can you uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, this? Is a field that I know very little about. Um, can you tell me about the generalizability of neuro studies <laughs> they've done with undergraduate students at universities compared to adults, compared to kids? I mean, amazing question. I can't answer it because I'm literally one of like two researchers doing this. <clears throat> my results are replicating, right, with my task and my study. Uh, but the goal is that this is bedded in a body of literature, and that should always be the case with neuro work. And I'm actively working to make sure I'm replicating. That's why I'm still using the same task I was using five years ago, is trying to see, are these results consistent? And once they're consistent, let's really start talking about what they mean. And the ERPs are very consistent. ERPs are consistent, yeah. and N170 is consistent. Um, my social tweaking of that, I probably need 10 more years to confidently answer that. Can I follow up? Yeah. Because, I mean, what we're talking about is viewing violence changing Early, early, early processing, yeah, yeah. I, I, I wonder, you know, how this neurological tracking works for someone who's grown up in rural poverty, Yep. you know, compared to these most kids in college or something like that. So, I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, is it even that, are the neural structures even, I mean, are they the same structure? Yes. Obviously, they all have the same brain, sorry. But, yep. But are, the, are they the same? Are they the same size in, you know, across populations? No, no, and there's early work on this. That's what kind of what led this was this work on children in ab abusive and neglected homes, totally modulations in these early ERP components. So no, they are not uniform, and that is definitely something I would like to delve more into. If you're in a high-conflict family, what happens to your ERP components? If you're in an um, abusive or a high-conflict marriage, what happens to these components? The implications are really broad. The components don't change, but how different groups respond to these components could definitely see variability. Did you have to tell me if your sample had been abused? I didn't. I didn't ask that. Mm -hmm. no, that would be really cool. Yeah. I know you probably are going to test this, but um, did you measure how much violent behaviors they mm -hmm. both groups used? Mm -hmm. Do you have any idea if there were a difference? I know you randomly assigned them to conditions. We did, and it's within subject, right? So it's the same people, subject. but I haven't looked at the moderators yet. We have that data. I haven't run it yet. I, had, I was crunching to get this done since we just finished it in <laughs> end of September, truthfully. So. Yeah? I have to go in five minutes to teach a class, so I wanted to say how it, it is for the audio people. There, you can uh, ask. I, uh, I open the door. Ignore her. It's fine. I, I, I don't think that she's right. She's opened the door. Right I open open the door. And I did that on purpose and intentionally. What, what would a week look like for you yeah. if you were to get this job? So with a part-time, let's keep in mind, this is part-time. And do you want part-time forever or just for a period of time? I can't commit. So let's plan on for at least, I got I got small kid and I want more small kids, right? So um, let's assume that this is for a while, right? Uh, I think we are super open to that conversation as my kids get into school and as things develop um, and as we get out of med school debt. My husband is fully on board and committed. You should know that what we're proposing, we break even on um, currently. So that is how fully on board we are all to this plan. But things get much easier, family finance, when the med school loans are paid off and flexibility <laughs> gets easier 
when we get there. Um, so what this looks like in my mind is a one, one, eight month contract with a one, one teaching load where I come to campus for um, a killer Thursday. So a 5 a.m. to midnight Thursday. And then I write and analyze from home the rest of the days of the week. So it was two and a half days a week. So it's like 40% of the time. So so, yeah. You'd be here. I, I think the, the key is. Or are you thinking more of three days a week? I mean, part time, is it half time or 60%? It would be part-time, I, I think is what we're thinking. And truthfully, some of this is negotiable, but what we need to be on the same page about is it is that one day a week, but it's not a typical BYU one day a week. It is a intense, very long one day a week. Like you. Yes, yes, <laughs> absolutely accurate. Um, it, and it, you know, we've already looked at flights, we've already been checking into this, it's very, very feasible and very doable. So. And the day that I would be here, my husband has off work. At that job, so he wouldn't have to be with the nanny all day, which is not the end of the world, but is helpful for me. The flexibility we pick up with the job that we chose actually makes this possible. Um, I could have, we could have totally ignored all the feelings we had and gone the very traditional route here, um, and we could have done that. And I can, with pretty much surety, tell you within five years we would have quit. I would have quit. I would have bowed out because there is no flexibility for him here. And so I need that with small kids. There's just no flexibility here. Yeah. Um, can you talk about kind of how you maintain collegiality with colleagues uh, just being here one day a week? Yeah, so yeah. Um, so we kind of, I've had this really awesome training period for the last four years running Project Media. I would have never thought that this was feasible until I had done Project Media. So I am super empathetic to what I'm asking you to just think about because it is so different than what I ever thought that my life or this would look like. Um, but what I have found works really well is you are efficient when you're here. And my Thursdays would not be my writing and analyzing time. My Thursdays would be, hey, let's talk about a project we want to work on. Hey, let's talk about measures. Hey, I need to be in the lab with my students. Hey, here's my student meetings. Um, so really, I think all that collegial stuff happens. There are things that I can see that I just need to address. Things like job interviews, which I think are highly important. Obviously, there'd be flexibility in those weeks. Obviously, I would be here more on those weeks because I want. I care who we hire. I'm invested in this. Um, things when I know in advance, I will be here more for things that are important. But the week to week expectation would be that one killer day a week. And truthfully, I'm not super concerned. I actually think. I'm like dead serious about this. I am a chatter and I am easily distracted and I really am social by nature. And I think if I was here all the time, y'all would be like, shut your freaking door. <laughs> it's to be crazy. So like that is true. We wasted so much time in grad school in our grad lab just chatting it up. Uh, so I, in so many ways, I think you all would actually be so grateful I'm not here all the time. <laughs> But I am just not so concerned. So hire you because we don't want you around. Yeah, exactly. Exactly <laughs> accurate. Exactly accurate. Yeah. One thing that completely shocked me, I, I came from a state university, was trying to do career hire. Something that completely shocked me coming here to BYU is the most meaningful and important in interactions I have had here at BYU have been in my office with students in my class. Totally. Someone who felt that her parents were abusing her and is now in Washington with a job, doing quite well, happy with her life, right? Those kinds of, of interactions. Um, how would you meet that? I mean, given that BYU is different yep. than every other university. Totally. That's a really, really good and fair question. Mm -hmm. um, you should talk to our Project Media students. So right now we already have the student leader, and I, I sincerely mean that. You should hunt them down privately if you are on the fence about this and talk to them. And they will tell you, I've asked them to tell me what they think, but there's a power differential there. And so you, like for real, this should happen. Because um, when I softly pull them, they're like, it's great, it's wonderful. Uh, what I can say with that is I'm doing something much more challenging currently where I'm physically never here. And I love the heck out of the students. And we have lots of these conversations. And we have lots and lots of mentoring happening behind the scenes on these things. When I was meeting with Dean Ogles, one of our former students passed me in the hall. And we like, were hugging. And he just was dying laughing. He's like, you don't even go here. <laughs> like, I know. I know. Um, so it will take differences, right? It will take 
being more available during my not here times for phone calls, for Skypes, for FaceTimes. I have found students extremely receptive to that. But if they're not comfortable with that approach, I am here one day a week, all day. And I will, move, I will make it a priority to make it work for them. Yeah, you're no rush. You're fine. I just like stopped to see if it was fine. Yeah. Okay. There's obviously a lot of conversations we have to have as a faculty to figure this out. But what do, you, what do you see as, I mean, we don't teach courses one day a week generally. And I think that would actually be really disruptive to the rest of the schedule in terms of rooms and everything. Mm -hmm. So what do you perceive your teaching? You, you say one class a semester, but how would that work or look? Um, something that we've talked about that I thought we all talked about, but we have not, which is fine, is a three hour class on Thursday afternoons. and. It's just once a week, a chunk, a huge class. And then another option we've talked about is a blended class, which is kind of what Jeff was doing this semester. So like uh, one day would be kind of online, and then one day would be in the class. So that'd be nice to see. I'm open to that. I think I'm better in the classroom. And so I would advocate for myself to have that three hour class. But if it doesn't work, shoot, we'll have that what conversation. What do you think about online classes? I mean, we're moving towards a, at the university more encouraging a few more online classes, and that's something that actually counts as faculty's normal load. It's not an overload type of a, okay. have you talked or thought about? I'm super open to that. I was under the impression that that was unfair. So you, you guys duke that out. I'm open to whatever. That's completely fine with me. Um, I would love some FaceTime, because I think, I think, I do agree that FaceTime is important, and so I would like some, but if that doesn't work, okay, we'll go from there. I feel I'm very, I've tried to be so transparent, and so I've told you the things I can't be flexible on, but everything else, sure, let's float it. Let's, let's be flexible, yeah. So my question comes to this super long Thursday. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've done interstate commuting once a week. Yes, you have, yes. Um, what's your plan for Friday? Is your husband not gonna be working Friday as well? Because I don't think you're gonna be Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we'll have a nanny still. <laughs> 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 um, I, I might start. I just want to know that yeah, you, yeah. Have, you have calculated this yes. into how yes. you, into you being comfortable yes. with this proposal. So Thursday's okay. not my only work day. We would have okay. a nanny as well. The thing that we also pick up with the other job is in-laws. So when there's emergencies and problems, I have grandma and grandpa who shockingly are super conservative and totally, when I called them and said, this is what we're thinking, said 100%, if there's an emergency, we will always step in. They probably won't actually, but um, <laughs> it was comforting. As someone who's been doing this now, essentially, this sounds wrong, my husband has zero flexibility right now, and I've seen what this looks like. It is not sustainable. And so um, all of this sounds so much easier than what I've already done. It will be long, hard Thursdays. Uh, I am confident that the Lord will multiply my efforts. And I might start drinking caffeine, and that's not the end of the world. So that's okay. We'll make it work. Yeah. So right now with your project media, how much time, um, like what, what does that involve? Yeah. My contract right now is 28 hours a week. Um, and realistically, regardless of what happens with this, I think we should go down to 20. We're producing enough. I can do my job. We're definitely producing enough. Um, so I would I would like to go down. The problem is contracts get tricky, so we got to figure that out. I'm also too expensive, so we got we to gotta figure all this out. But... Um, I, I'm already doing it, is kind of what I'm getting at. Yeah, I'm already working. My contract is 28. Realistically, there are weeks that it's 40, and there's weeks that it's closer to 20, for sure. So what do you do with that project money? I mean, project Project media? What's <laughs> 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 our next project? Okay, project media. Wait, like, yeah. what do you do? So we have a bunch of people in this room who are on this project, so please correct me if I overstep at any point, uh, for sure. Uh, please, please, please actually do. Don't be so invested in me that you don't overstep. Uh, so my job is the managerial side, but I'm also a PI on that project, which was what inspired me about that project in the first place is I got to be both. So I definitely am on the PI side, and then I handle everything else. <laughs> yeah, so over, yeah, Principal investigator. Okay, yeah. so does that mean, with me on this. No, this is great. Does that mean that you're spending your time on the computer? Are you spending your time with students? Are you spending, like... Yeah. Let me give you, like, kind of what my week looks like. Uh, so it involves a ton of emails in my inbox from former students asking for rec letters, because regardless of how we spin this, that first week that I'm there in Denver, for whatever reason, the students latch to me. So all the faculty take turns going to Denver, but something about being there that first week, they're super vulnerable. There's also a lot of but like 
interviewing and hiring and the class that they take before, there's a lot of communication with me. So we have a really good relationship so that way. So closely with students at that Yeah, point. and the yeah. people I truly work the most with are the student yeah. leaders. So the oh, student okay. leaders run our project on the ground the whole time we're in Denver. I have mm -hmm. weekly Skype meetings with them. Um, they text me and call me all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, that, they're, yes, there's, that's where I'm doing most of my heavy mentoring, and we are in constant, almost too frequent contact. So, but that's what I signed up for. So, okay. It's getting less. They're reaching out to you guys more now. Oh, they, yeah, they talk to me all the time. Um, our plan is, so if Laura gets this job, we'll hire another project media manager. Okay. So we'll take all the admin stuff, but then she could do more. So she's not doing the analyzing. You're doing the... I'm doing both. Oh, she does they that can, too. Oh, yeah. okay. So you, all right, you're just doing everything. Kind of. Kind of right now. That's but it. you work a lot with students and one-on-one, -on -one, yeah. even though you're remote. Yeah, and that isn't a model that I want forever. I think that FaceTime, I agree that FaceTime is important. And mm -hmm. FaceTime, being here once a week on campus is more ideal than what I currently have. But what we currently are doing has worked, and I'm learning a lot and have learned a lot. Um, and you should ask them. Like, for real, you should ask them, do they feel like this is working or not? Um, and they should give you their, their blunt. They'll give you their feedback. So. It's your time. Thank you. Thank you.